conversation. It seems like such a simple task, doesn't it? You open your mouth and words come out. And yet, we have this uncanny ability to mess it up and get it wrong. Case in point. Let me tell you about Paul. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Case in point. A rather pretentious lady walks up to the stock boy at the local grocery store, and in a rather snobbish tone, she inquires as to whether she might purchase half a head of lettuce. This stock boy, having never received such an odd request, promptly turned and marched towards the back of the store to ask his manager. Unbeknownst to him, she had also turned and was following on his heels to the back of the store to meet the manager. He gets to the manager and says, Boss, you're not going to believe this. There's some nut job, nut job wacko out front that wants half a head of lettuce. And then out of the corner of his eye, he sees her standing there. He turns and smiles real big and said, and this sweet lady would like the other half. <laughs> Conversation. It seems like it should be such an easy task. You open your mouth and words come out. And yet we all have those moments, don't we? When we get it terribly, horribly wrong. Conversation is complicated. But it's also important. And that's why we have spent several weeks now having a conversation about conversations. Because it's complicated and it's important. So important, in fact, that I would view it as a genuine tragedy if we spent all these weeks together talking about the biblical principles of communication and when it was all said and done, more was said than done. That scares me. It really does. And so today, as you can see on the screen behind me, we're going to spend some time talking about the principle of application. Because just like a lot of the other things in life, you can have that, that wisdom, that knowledge in your head, but as we've said before, Unapplied truth is like unapplied paint. It doesn't do anybody any good. Application is everything. It's the doing that makes all the difference. In other words, when it comes to our faith, we need more walk and less talk. And fortunately for us, there are several people in Scripture who do a really great job of bringing this reality to the forefront of their teaching. And I would say that other than Jesus himself, James, the brother of Jesus, is the most convincing. I mean, just imagine what it must have been like to be Jesus' brother. How wild would that be? Imagine the stories you would have to tell if you were Jesus' brother. Now, one thing we know is that James, the brother of Jesus, came to the conclusion that his older brother Jesus was actually the Son of God, which is amazing. It's incredible. And it's that very same James that has a lot to say about the significance of application. And here's what I love about this text. The text that we're getting ready to read in just a moment was written over 2,000 years ago, and yet as we read it, it's equally as applicable to our lives today as it was the day it was written. Here's the text, James chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. And you put on the brakes right away, and you go, wait a minute, what? how in the world does the mere act of listening cause self-deception? Well, let me tell you what he's getting ready to tell you. He's about to tell us that this happens in church every single Sunday, in every single church. In fact, it's happening right now at this very moment because 
in our church, just like in the synagogue 2,000 years ago, there's this sense in which people thought, you know, if I'm just in the building, I get credit. If I'm in the church building, if I'm in the synagogue, then God goes, ah, he's in church, she's in church. Big red check mark on your heavenly church attendance pad. God smiles and goes, ah, good job, you were in church. Check mark, better parking spot at the mall next Thursday. Well done. <laughs> or maybe it's, some of you would prefer three extra points on that next test. Good job, you were present. You probably prefer this one. Gas prices will drop before you fill up your tank next time. But whatever it is, we feel like, we feel like God looks at us in church and goes, I'm so happy you're in the building. And we think that because we're in the building, sitting in a pew like good Methodists do, enduring yet another sermon, it's like, it's like uh, I stayed awake 90% of the time. God, did you see me? I was awake 90% of the time, and 70% of that 90% I was actually paying attention. I wasn't counting ceiling tiles or, or uh, texting my friends pretending to be taking notes. Yes, we can tell the difference. In our modern American church culture, we think like the Jewish culture did 2,000 years ago. We think God somehow gives us credit for just being here to listen. And we think that somehow makes us more spiritual people. Now, here's the other thing that happens in church, and this is so incredibly strange, but it's so incredibly true. If you go to a church where your pastor regularly teaches about the significance of application, isn't it true that there are times when you go home from church and you feel bad about yourself? Have you ever felt bad about yourself in church? Like, yep, okay, I get it. Thanks, preacher. I'm a failure. I got you. Now, here's what's so amazing to me. In our American church culture... We consider that a religious experience. <laughs> we do. We think, I went to church. I felt like a complete loser as a father. I went to church. I felt like a complete failure as a mother. I went to church, and I felt like I'm not a very good follower of Jesus. I went to church, and I felt bad about myself. And when I felt bad about myself, it was like, Religious. I felt so bad about myself that I felt close to God. And we, we consider that a valuable religious experience. Isn't that crazy? And do you know, do you know what's equally as crazy? Nobody taught us this. It's not like we had a class and somebody told us God is way over here and you are way over here. So if you want to connect with God, it takes lots and lots of guilt. No one ever taught us that. It's just this weird thing that happens. If we're in the church building and we listen and we even feel bad about ourselves, it's like, okay, I got some credit for doing something religious. And I walk out and I feel better about myself. We walk out and we feel better about ourselves for having felt bad about ourselves. And that's why James is saying, no, 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 no. You're deceiving yourselves. Now, let me pause for just a moment and check in with everybody here and everybody online because I would imagine... If you're not a Christian, you have got to be smiling and loving every bit of this so far. Now, I know you probably don't say amen. That's something church people say. But if you did say amen, I imagine we would have had a couple of shouts by now. And here's why. Because you don't go to church. And you're as good or better than some of the people you know that do go to church. And you're sick and tired of hearing them 
talk about their church. And you're sick and tired of hearing them invite you to church. And you're sick and tired of feeling looked down on because you choose not to go to church. See, here's what you know. You know what James knows. You know that those Christian friends of yours who don't talk any better than you do, who don't work any harder than you do, who don't study any harder. In fact, they cheat just like you do. They stare at women just like you do. They swear and curse just like you do. They abuse alcohol. I mean, they are just like you. And you look at them and you realize, well, I don't know that I believe in the Bible, but I think that James guy was right. Because you realize what they don't realize which is they think they're better than you because they've been to church and endured a sermon. And they got their kids there. And they even remembered to sign the attendance pad on the way through the door. And they feel like they're superior to you because they listen. They don't plan on doing anything with, with what they heard, but at least they listened, right? They deceived themselves. And you, as an outsider looking in, you're thinking, you Christians, you church people, you, you're so self-deceived. You think that somehow you're a better person than me because you got up earlier than me on Sunday, you fought some traffic, endured some kind of a, a speech, and then you came home, but you're... You're no better than me. And James, the brother of Jesus, would say, High five, amen, you're absolutely right. They are no better than you. If all they did was listen, feel guilty, throw a couple of dollars in the plate, and go home and say, Well, I had my family in church. We were in the building. Aren't you glad you came to church for this positive, uplifting, encouraging message? So James, the brother of Jesus, let's get back to our text. James, the brother of Jesus, says this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Now, hang on, here we go. You ready? Do what it says. Whoa, hang on. No, 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 no. I can't, I can't start that. If I start doing what it says, that will mess everything up. See, I've already got my strategy all plotted out. I've planned my plan, and I'm working my plan. See, listen, here's my plan. I just want a big red check mark for being present, hearing it, and feeling bad that I'm not doing it. But if I actually start doing what the Bible says, I won't feel guilty. And the only time I feel close to God is when I feel guilty and I'm telling Him I'm sorry. Do what it says. No, 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 no. That would mess up my entire religious experience. And again, James is saying, you're self-deceived. Do what it says. It's the doing that makes all the difference. Yes, believing is great, but application is what makes all the difference. Now, here is where it starts getting really excited because James gives, gives us a most excellent illustration of what he's talking about. And if you're a visual learner like me, you'll appreciate this. This is so great. James chapter 1, we'll pick up at verse 23. Those who listen, in other words, you know, they sit in the pews like good Methodists do. They take a note or two. They go to small group. They go to Sunday school. You know, those who listen to the word of God but do not do what it says are like people who look at their face in a mirror, which immediately connects with us because this is something that we've all done today. At least one or 19 times. Those who listen to the word but do not do what it says are like people who look at their faces in a mirror and after looking at themselves go away and immediately forget what they look like. 
How's that for an illustration? James is saying a person who comes and sits in a pew, listens to what he or she needs to do, and goes, oh, wow. Oh, wow, I, I really do need to do that. Oh, wow, I really do need to stop doing that. Oh, wow, oh, wow. And they, they sit through all that, and then they get up and leave the church, and they don't do anything about their oh, wows. James says that guy is exactly like someone who gets up in the morning, walks into the bathroom, glances in the mirror and goes, whoa, and then just goes on to, goes on to work. Now, as you have discovered, once you get to be past about 13, you don't do that anymore, do you? In fact, I want you to think about something, especially, especially those of us who are over the age of 40. Think about the money you spend because of the mirrors you own. <laughs> or even better, think about all the stuff laid out on your bathroom countertop right now that you have bought specifically so you could address the early morning, oh, wow. It's amazing, isn't it? And when you travel, what do you have to do? You have to have an oh, wow, travel bag. So that when you wake up away from home and you see the mirror, you can immediately pull out your oh wow travel bag and begin to work on your face and your hair and your teeth. And when do you stop looking in the mirror? When everything looks just right. James is telling us that unfortunately, we invest more time we have more commitment to the things we see in the physical mirror than we do fixing what's in the mirror of our heart. When God's Word is held up in front of your heart and you go, oh wow, I really need to work on that. Oh wow, I really need to stop doing that. Oh wow, I really need to be more disciplined in that area. Oh wow, I need to be kinder with my words. Oh wow, I should really quit saying that to my mom. Oh wow, I need to study harder. Oh wow, I don't need to drink so much. Oh wow, I really need to break off that relationship. Oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. Uh, but I'm not going to do anything. I, I just want to say, oh wow. Which makes me say, oh wow. James says, do you know what the problem is? And let me just remind you, James is saying this, not me, so don't get mad. He was Jesus' brother, you know. And he's talking to the believer. He's talking to the Christian, and he says, look, you're more committed to things that don't make that big of a difference than you are to the things that make all the difference. See, whether you get every hair in place and your makeup is perfect has nothing to do with the direction and the quality of your life. But what Scripture teaches about the words that we use and how we choose to use them, what Scripture teaches about judgment and judging other people, what Scripture teaches about morality and relationships and marriage and finances and the way you handle yourself at work and integrity, all of those things do actually determine the direction and quality of your life. And James wants us to hear him when he says, you're more committed to fixing what you see in the physical mirror, things that don't make that big of a difference, than you are to all the things that make all the difference. And he's pleading with us, stop deceiving yourself. You show up at church and you look awesome, and you feel awesome, but you don't behave awesome, and that's not awesome. He says, you've totally deceived yourself. In fact, let me get serious on you for a moment. If, if you're anything like me, here's what I would be willing to bet. I bet there's a moment from your past And when your house is quiet, or you're in the car driving by yourself, 
there's a moment from your past and you reflect back on, on a night, a week, or maybe a season of your life. And every time you reflect back on that moment, it fills you with regret. And every time you reflect back on that moment and it fills you with, with regret, you always think, oh, if I could just go back. You can picture it in your mind's eye, if I could just go back and choose differently. That would totally redirect my whole life. If I could go back to that one week, if I could go back to that one week and make wiser choices, if, if I could go back to that one season, maybe my junior year in college, or maybe that first year in the military, if I could just go back to that one season, that one week, that one night, and get a do-over. If I could just make wiser choices, I know I would have fewer regrets. And here's the hardcore irony. I also bet that if you were to look back at yourself on that one night, that one week, that one season, I bet... Your hair looked amazing. And I bet your makeup was, oh, your makeup was so perfect it became part of the problem, didn't it? You had never looked better and behaved poorer. That fresh haircut, that clean shave, and the fact that your belt matched your shoes did absolutely nothing to direct the quality and the direction of your life. But that lack of application plunged you into a big, hot mess. And you deceived yourself. Now let me try to, to lighten it up with, with another sort of illustration of what, what we do. Um, it's kind of like me, if I were to get up in the morning, and I would go look in the mirror, and I go, oh wow. I really need to shave. I really need to shave. And I look at myself in the mirror and go, oh, wow, I really need to shave. And I don't do anything. I just smile and go on to work. And fellow employees go, Jeff, you really need to shave. And I go, yeah, I know. I noticed that this morning. I know I need to shave. And then I go to small group. That evening, and they're like, Jeff, did you shave today? No, but I know I need to. In fact, someone mentioned it to me earlier today. Would you gather around me, Mr. S this small group, would you gather around me, and let's say a prayer, because I know, I know I need to pray. I mean, I know I need to shave. And they're like, dude, just, just go do it. Oh, no, I don't want to actually do anything. I just want it to be a prayer request. I want you to pray for me, and, and, you know, and then you can talk about me behind my back. And, and it's like, just look in the mirror and deal with what you see. Just look in the mirror and deal with what you see. So I have a prayer and a request, and then we'll be done. First, my prayer. My prayer is that you will be ambushed by God. Have you ever been ambushed by God? The truth of God's Word just kind of slaps you on the back of your head. It wakes you up. The light bulb goes on, and you go, Whoa, what was I thinking? Some of you, whether here or online, you've been carrying around the same habits, the same lack of discipline for years and years. Every time it comes to mind, you go, yeah, I know I really need to work on that. And you feel closer to God for having said that because, well, at least I'm honest. At least I'm being transparent. And James is saying, honest and transparent or not, you're deceiving yourself. It's not doing any good because application is 
everything. It's what you do, not what you intend to do, not what you ought to do. It's not even what you feel God calling you to do. It's the doing that makes all the difference. And now my request. I want to invite you to, to sometime this week, I want you to imagine yourself ten years from today. And the ten years from today you is looking back at the today you. And you see all the oh wows and all the unchanged changeables. And I want you to ponder, is the ten year from me, me, as he looks back on the today me, is he filled with regret? Is she looking back going, boy, I wish I could go back to that one day, ten years ago, that one week, that one season. I wish I could go back and get a do-over. I wish I could go back to that one Sunday when I was in church and I listened and I felt bad, but I didn't do anything. See, it may be too late for a do-over, but it's never too late for a makeover. Please, please do not leave here today thinking, well, I'll just take care of that tomorrow. Take care of it today. It's not too late to make some changes. It's not too late to, to begin to engage the application process in your life. It's not too late for a makeover. Father, we're thankful. Whether we feel today as though we've never been closer to you, or maybe, maybe we feel like we've kind of lost our focus at some point and we're a little bit further away from you than we realized or possibly we've never really given you much thought at all. Regardless of where we may find ourselves today, we're so thankful that your word tells us we can be a part of your family by simply asking to be. So Father, if there be anyone here or listening online, I pray you would hear their words, even if, even if they don't speak them out loud, even if they are hidden in their heart and they say, yes, Jesus, I believe in you. Yes, Jesus, I want to know more about you. May that be the beginning of a fresh start. Thank you, Father. We pray all of this in Jesus' name.